Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. I'm also CEO and founder of Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we deliver HR companies for far and fewer people. With a platform that automates HR, we're providing you access to a dedicated HR business person for more HR challenge, more challenging HR challenges. Our guest today is Charles Connor. Charles, thanks for being here today. Hey, man. Thanks, Jason, for having me. You know, I appreciate you uh, bringing me in today, man. Yes, yes. You know. It's been a fun conversation. <laughs> so what is it that you do for fun? I know art's your hobby. I mean, your work we're going to get into. What do you actually do for fun? Or is art actually fun for you? Well, art is actually fun for me. But if I have to say what I do for fun, probably video games or maybe hiking. Okay. Just being outside. I'll tell you one thing. 99.9% of the people ask that question, I always say hiking. It's like, if you don't like hiking, come see how somehow it's like, it just transforms you. Like, it's almost like, it's like, it's um, inevitable. If you come, you have to go hiking. Yeah, but it ain't always just like, oh, I just like being out in the woods. It's like, I really like being near water more than anything. Yeah, water is my common place too. So like, but if I go someplace like a uh, big four ice caves, mm -hmm. like, you know, it's a short hike, yeah. but then overall you get to be around these ice caves in this vast area. It's just like something that you don't normally see, especially where yeah. I come from. So it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to get to Mississippi in a little bit. Yeah, I don't think there's much hiking opportunities in Mississippi. No, most of the time, I mean, you can you can always find some because most of the things people don't think about hiking. They just think about maybe camping, yeah. fishing, being outdoors. Mm -hmm. So you still get to be outdoors. And I think that's the, the good thing that translates. Yeah. It's just you got more actual hiking trails yeah. in this area. And you grew up in Mississippi, correct? Mississippi and Alabama. So you can see yourself like a cold, cold country boy or a city boy? Country. Oh, country. I, I choose country or be on the outskirts yeah. of a city. I don't like being directly in the city. It's yeah. too annoying. Yeah. It's too much noise pollution. And yeah, so you grew up like hunting, fishing, all that kind of stuff? Heck no. No. I wasn't that one. I, no. Fishing. It wasn't that country. Fishing, yes. Yeah. But I never I never was one to really hunt. Yeah. Fishing more than anything, but just being outside in the country with my cousins. Okay. Being like that. Little country living. I grew up country living too as a yeah. young kid. So what kind of fish is it? Is it mainly catfish there or no, they got bass, bass, trout. bass. They still Herc. got bass, trout, Herc, I didn't know that trout catfish. But mostly you're going to see bass and oh, catfish. Bass, yeah. I forgot about bass, yeah. Yeah. Because fish and bass is a whole different way than fish and bass versus trout versus salmon, right? Correct. Yeah. You know, you still got to have some patience, but it's more common because that's what you're going to see if people yeah. do a lot more. I remember bass fish like waiting for the little bobber thing to go down in the water. <laughs> like, man, come on, have no patience as a kid. Like, what's it going to go down? I mean... But then that's the thing you have to you try to have to forget about it and just enjoy being out there. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah, you're right. And You'll then just you forget like, about that for the goes down. Like, where's my bopper at? And the bass <laughs> done went, you know, he done he done gone somewhere. You yeah. just like really? Yeah, I didn't spend all this time sitting here. You, you do any fishing up here? I haven't fished up here honestly in a minute because once they start talking about you gotta have a license. Yeah, I was just like, all right, man. <laughs> man, have you gone deep sea fishing off the coast yet? I've never been. You deep should sea try fishing. that. I've never been deep sea fishing because I always probably. think about like when people think about deep sea fishing, I'm like marlins and yeah. stale fish. No, they have like I've gone a few times. Um, that salmon, like cod, different things. It's, it's okay. a lot of fun. Yeah, it's a lot of fun, especially when they they do everything for you. They you know hook their reel for you. You just gotta reel it in right. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Then I, that I haven't done. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun to fish because salmon. Them salmon are fighters, yo. I know they fight. They go all around the boat and stuff. You know, they tell you that like, Captain Line, you have to like. Like go above underneath other people's lines and stuff, you know? Yeah. yeah. They ain't trying to get caught. No. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's not going to be something like a, a bass. So or even if they put up a fight, it's almost like dealing with like a barracuda. Oh, yeah. Stuff. Yeah. They're going it, to, yeah, it, it's going to take at least 10, 15 minutes at a minimum to bring one in. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, you got to be in the mood to be out there for that, just for that struggle right yeah. there. So it's like, you already know. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely recommend going to go. Fish off the coast if you can. It's a lot of fun. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, what, what's your favorite game to play? You have a favorite one? I'm I'm a big fan of uh, kind of like the open world, the sandbox. So like, God of War, God of War Ragnarok, Ghost of Tsushima, Red Dead Redemption Two, those type because they're basically like playing movies in a way. Like the the character development of Last of Us, the the character developments on those are fast so it's literally like you get to watch people grow you you get your villains you get the people you can't stand you get the people you don't want to see go like it really video games now are so much more in depth 
that it's hard to find one that's just like a point and click now. Like they have so much storyboard. It's they're based like many movies, right? Really, it is like you can even go on YouTube if they ha if you go and just watch cut scenes of video games. They'd be like six hours long. And they have the scripts, the video production, all the whole nine Everything. yards. Everything. They literally have full-blown scripts. And I would say it's probably harder than a movie because a movie had this one script, but in a video game, okay, player A did this, player B did this, and yep. all these like variables you got to do. And then, of course, they want you to do, you know, act the lines. And, and a lot of times the people do the motion capture as well. So you're doing the voice and the motion capture. So you got to act everything out as you're doing it, you know, and... Like some of those characters are just in depth. I mean, we ride for Arthur Morgan, mm -hmm. like Arthur Morgan, Joel, Ellie. Like they get real in depth with those characters to the point where you just like, man, you you get wrapped up in them almost. It's like soap opera. Uh -huh. Yeah, like yeah. you know, like yeah. people would always. I gotta watch my soaps. Yeah, it, that's how those video games become now. They just so got darn good. You just like when things happen, you actually become heartbroken, or you become joyous, yeah. or you. You become frightened for him. You like, yeah. Cause you become invested in the story, right? You really do. It's like it ain't so much Mario Brothers, no. To where you can just press the button and jump, move on, and it's like I really got to decide on how I'm gonna move <laughs> in this thing. And if I do this, I can cause this to uh -huh. happen. Crap. So it's like they make you think more about strategy in that way. Does it matter if you play on Xbox, PlayStation, or something else? Does that matter at all? It does. Okay. I'm a PlayStation guy. You're a PlayStation guy. I've always been a PlayStation okay. guy. Any particular reason it's always been like that? Catalog. Okay. It's always been that way, but the catalog, because they have exclusive stuff that's just for PlayStation. Okay. One of them being like Tekken. Like Tekken has always been a PlayStation thing. And then Xbox would do something similar like Dead or Alive. But you like, it's not yeah, the same. but Tekken came out of like 96. Yeah. And now they on the eighth one is like. So if one of your friends said, hey, Charles. Want to come to the house playing on Xbox? You'd be like, yeah, I don't know, dude. I don't know, dude. You're my friend, but man. <laughs> I'd, I'd still go and play, but I'd be probably complaining about the controller. Some, like, comments and stuff. Controller. Fit. What is this, man? It feel like I'm, I'm, I'm holding a specialty yeah. mouse or something. It's like, you got some people that love it, but it's like PlayStation has always been. It's like almost that. like PlayStation, Xbox, almost like, you know, Android and iPhone almost, you know. Yeah, it is. that. Honestly, it is that way because people really start looking at what it can do for you. Like, Oh, PlayStation already has this built into it. Xbox, you got to buy this separately. Yeah. It's like, why would I do that? No. Yeah. And, and you've been playing like games since a little kid? Oh, yeah, man. Okay. I still remember when we got a Nintendo as a child, uh -huh. man. Like, my brother would love to sit there and act like, oh, he got it for me. But yeah. it was like, yeah, yeah, but it's both ours. Like, I still remember playing Mario. I remember having an Atari. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember Atari, yeah. You know, playing not... I remember Akari Warriors <laughs> on Atari. And, you know, it's just like stuff like that. It's like, come on. Do you ever go? I know they recently had like some kind of like a video game or gaming conference in Seattle. Do you ever go into those conferences like that or Comic Con or anything like that? Man, or gaming I, I, I have yet to go to one. That's been something that I want to do because I know it's like you got to either dedicate a day or two to that specifically because you can buy tickets for one day. But I do want to go. I know they got like, I think King Kong comes up in the fall. Yeah, I have a friend. Ring. I have a friend. He does like SEO for YouTube gaming gaming channels. Yeah, and there was like a, a Halo conference, or something like a couple weeks ago, like seventy five dollars for three days. I was gonna go, but I couldn't. It was just too much. Yeah, it's it's like those things. I do want to definitely uh, just just go to 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 look at because there's so many cons out. But I'd love to just go and check them out, just to view and see who they got. Any special guests like. I ain't trying to be one of those. It's like, hey, I'm there all day. I yeah. got to get my ticket for this hall. Yeah. It's like, no, nah, I just want to be around. Walk around. Ride. Yeah. Yeah. All the creativity, Correct. creative engineering and stuff. Correct. Just want to check out the creativity, see what they got going on there. Maybe I run into something awesome. You know, maybe so, not. So if art is more traditional art, right? Have you ever thought about like, combining your art with a like, game, like doing like art for game studios or something like that? Man, that type of stuff was my whole thing growing up was always sequential art comic books. Mm -hmm. Like that was always the thing that I wanted to be involved with because that's, that was one thing that was more accessible, just by having comic books, but you didn't think it was actually a thing you could do. Like now they actually got schools you can go to for sequential art. But like, I didn't honestly think about video game art. It never comes up in my mind until somebody like would say it. 
because it was always like I like this style and I like how they do these you know these type of things like always like the way people set up comic books and and how those panels were drawn you got the splash pages you know and then re not even realizing sometimes the cover art is done by one artist and the rest of the comic is done by another and you'd be like hold on man this art style ain't the same yeah but then that way you get to learn more about the different styles and, and how people do their thing as well okay so it was always more sequential art for me not so much video so game so what is art. what does that mean what's sequential art what is that uh that's basically a fancy way of saying comic book art. Okay. Instead of saying comic book artist. So you talk about like the, how the art, comic books have the frames and Correct. stuff? Correct. So okay. it, it all goes in a, cent a sequence, like okay. a storyboard. Okay. So that is actual, that's what they call it now. It's a sequential art. So that's the like academic term for it. Now, okay. You know, which like I said, you growing up, you didn't think that was a thing. Mm -hmm. Comic books, you thought I got to go here for this degree. I got to go here. But it's like you can get specific and have that degree, which I wish more things were like that. Yeah. You know. Now for art, are you pretty much self-taught or do you go to a school or something or have an art degree or learn or do you just learn on your own? Most of it came from, you know, most of it came from family. Uh, my family taught me a lot growing up um, on, as far as uh, starting off like Ninja Turtles and, and things like that. Because the Ninja Turtles in the 80s and 90s was like the best of the best of the best. Yeah, I was going to ask you next. Talk yeah. about your relationship with the Ninja Turtles. Like that was the bit. I, I mean, I had a Ninja Turtles watch. And like I remember drawing the watch. So it was like it was always something that I had. But then my older brothers knew how to draw it better. So they would show me little tips on how to do this. You know, my, my mom and my sister, they knew how to do uh, more realistic drawings of, of people and women and hairstyles. So they, it was always something that they taught me when it came to art, and I just kind of would implement that. But I was really good at just drawing stuff that came out of my head, like I can make up with my own characters. But then I started really tapping in and just focusing on, like, how can I draw this? How can I draw that? But I learned a lot from my, my family and, and friends. So as I got started growing up and getting older, like, I remember drawing characters on my own. I remember I met one of my best friends in the third grade my man, Mike, and he was looking at it. And he was like, he ain't got no chin. Cause I was drawing him like the Simpsons, you know, nose and two lips. But then he was like, gotta put, gotta do this. And the next thing you know, they got a chin. It's like, oh, now it looks more like a person. And so I would take those tips and just keep going. Yeah, have you developed any of your own characters? Yeah. I, it's funny. I still have notepads of characters that I, I created myself um, and I just kept them. So I, I, I have these characters still in the stash. So it's like if I want to use them and do something with them, I have my own designs. I have my own characters that I would create. Um, I just would always just kind of like keep them like the majority of the things that I draw, and paint or whatever. It's something that I come up myself. Um, but I always went for something that was going to be a, like a bit more realistic. Like I was never like really a cartoony, cartoony person. Like I can draw that by seeing it, but like I always liked my style. Like I said, I've leaned more towards superhero stuff because mm -hmm. I like the dynamic type of character, you know? So I always created things that were like that. So do you only draw stuff like, like you get inspired by or someone, or some, or some, someone can come to you and say, hey, Charles, draw this for me, right? Mm -hmm. Do you do both or just only draw what you're inspired by? I can do both. I'm not a big, um, <laughs> you know, give me a bicycle clown. It's like, what? No. Like if somebody is, if somebody comes to me with an idea and there's something they want me to create, you know, that's usually going to be a commission based mm -hmm. thing. I'm going to get as much information from them and I'll do it my way, but I'm, I'm going to make sure I get as much information so I can, cause I want it to be right for them. Mm -hmm. But I primarily just uh, create what I feel and what I get inspired by. Like last night, there's, you know, you got the art walk going on. You know, one of uh, my homegirls, Jess, she has her uh, a show that's going down at Slip Gallery. And you get inspired by seeing all these different artists that you know, but now you get to see they, they work out in the wild. You get to see these different styles of different artists, people that you don't even know. And my whole feeling is like, man, I'm just ready to get out of here so I can go paint. You know, because you want to, now you start getting all these ideas like, man, I got, oh, 
I was wondering how I would think about this. And now I see something that can kind of push me that way. So I get a, inspired a lot by things that I see. And that just kind of triggers off all these different ideas as well. So the term starver artist is out there because of reason, right? Mm -hmm. What are you doing to make sure you take your business that you don't become a quote unquote starving artist? Honestly, it's one of those things where the majority of art, uh, artists usually going to have a nine to five. They use the nine to five to pay for all the art stuff that they want to do. They want to do a solo show or they want to, they got to go buy canvases. They got to go buy all their supplies. That stuff all costs money. And the majority of the time artists do things for free before there's any kind of payoff. Like you, the amount of stuff that you just do and there's nothing that comes from it except for maybe a, some gratitude. That's going to be more often than not, but it's that one time that it pays off. And then it's like that sets you up for maybe half the year or the rest of the year. But the majority of artists are doing something else to take care of that 70% and the artists at 30 until that art can fulfill everything else that they want. It's just about those opportunities. And that's why you keep doing it because you can get that one shot and it's just like this set up my whole year. And now you have more opportunities based off of that. So the majority of artists, yeah, if they were to just quit their job, yeah, for real, you it's going to be a struggle. It's going to be a real struggle because you got more people often than not that love what you do, but they ain't trying to really spend money like that. They'll love what you do. They'll spend that money on a trip. They'll spend that money on some shoes. They'll spend it on a handbag. But then they'll be like, oh, I can find that cheaper at Ross. Or I can find that someplace at Home Goods. And you just like, I right, would well then go to Home Goods because I'm not going to compromise on what, what I want, you know? So you'll get you get that a lot more than that, that 18 point buck. But it's that 18 point book that keeps you going because you're not going to stop just because somebody told you no. And like, how do you decide what price to charge? How does that work out? Just, just exper experimentation or based on other artists? It's, uh, it's honestly, it can, it's, can be different formulas that I know some artists that charge based on an hourly rate, almost like a graphic designer, like a graphic designer say, hey, I charge $40 an hour. That's their rate. Um, so some artists, they'll, they charge based on uh, materials used, time spent, um, and they also charge can charge based off of complexity. So you, gotta, you, you can factor in a bunch of things like that as well. Like I use a couple scales that just as almost like reference um, that I usually keep on my phone or my iPad, where it's literally like, 25 cents per uh, square inch. Then it'll go down the scale. All right, if the canvas is 30 by 40, this is how much you would charge per square inch if you're going off 25 cents, 50 cents, 75 cents a dollar. And it goes up like that. Then you have scales that are saying, hey, for a person that's three to five years of doing this, this is what you generally would charge for this size of, of piece of art. So it's kind of like you can kind of go off of those type of scales. If you have, like I said, a set thing, if you're not going by per hour, you can be like, I charge 85 cents per square inch. You want it on a 40 by 60. This is how much it's going to cost. And you could just leave it at that. But a lot of people think about how much time did I spend on this? Mm -hmm. I was working on this for two weeks. I want two weeks worth of pay mm -hmm. at the least. So 1500 That's That's what I'm going to charge you. And you got, you know, a lot of people that will definitely pay that. But then some, so there are some artists that really get overinflated and be like, it'd be a size of this phone and 3000 and you're like, okay, now you might want to think about that. Come on now. Like, even if it's good, you might want to think about that. Yeah. So let's suppose you, you, you start a piece of art, right? Mm -hmm. What's the process like and how long does it take? I know the answer depends. Like, does it take like, you do like 10 drafts of it? You take do you take two or three weeks? How does that work? Usually, I always I usually will always start. Um, I look up different material. I think about something that's inspiring me. I'll look up material based off that inspiration, uh, and then I'll usually start sketching the idea that I'm thinking of. 
Uh, once I've gotten the idea solid and I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to go with. I got my main piece. I got well, my background. I have to figure out like what kind of background color I want to use. If it's just the single object and the background is blank, I need to think about what a complementary background would, be, would, would look like. Or if I want the background to be detailed, I want to make sure that's all in my sketch as well. Once I have that, what I, what I do now is I project that bad boy right onto my canvas and, and trace that on my canvas because it saves so much more time. I used to sit there and just freehand it and it take you friggin' hours and hours and hours because you're trying to freehand it and keep the proportions the same. Now I just throw that bad boy right on the projector, sketch it. And it's like, I'm done in three times the time it's, it's so much faster. And then I can actually spend more time actually painting it. But generally when I come up with that idea, I'll even lay down my colors because I'll do it on my iPad. I'll lay down the colors that I want to use so I can see how it looks. Then that way I know I only need these paints here. And that way I'm not fumbling all over the place trying to figure out ah, what should I do next. It's like I try to make sure it's lined up and prepped pretty well before I actually lay it down on canvas. And do you like only work on one project at a time? Or you have like two or three, four projects going on at the same time? Generally, I'm working on one canvas painting, but probably three or four different drawings on my iPad Okay, because the canvas painting, that's maybe my main thing, but I already got that idea. I'm already working on that, but now I'm ne working on the next one that I want to paint and the next one and the next one. So it's like, I may have this idea growing, switch over and start working on another. So I literally may have three or four different drawings going at the same time because I'm trying to decide whether or not I actually want to paint this, mm -hmm. or maybe this is only something I want to do di a digital painting of and make into prints, posters, stickers, things like that. So I decide which one, because not everything that I draw, I turn into a painting and, and vice versa. Sometimes it's just going to be a digital painting. So what does it mean when, when someone says, I'm a creative? What does that even mean? It really just means that you have the ability to pull stuff out of thin air. You can, you know, you might be able to, you might be good at, um, being uh what's the word uh like ingenuity you may be good at ingenuity you might be able to just man i can create something i can come up with a concept but i might not be able to implement it but i can boom i can come up with some oh this would be a good idea to be able to do this it's, it just means that they can think outside the box that creativity may form itself in interior design it may form itself in uh event planning but they are known for just being somebody that thinks outside the box. It doesn't, it ha doesn't have to lend itself to pencil and paper or paintbrush or anything like that. It can be anything outside of that. That is that allows you to be creative and not just stick to how things should be. And so how long have you been an actual professional artist? Uh, probably only like three and a half years. Maybe. Okay. And what made you decide to go full all in on this? Really like the the pandemic, I would say the pandemic really kind of showed you like once you started looking for material, everything was gone. You're like, what the heck is going on? It's always stocked. Now nothing is available. Um, and you have more time to actually sit down and do and focus on this. And then you realize I've always been doing it, but then this was the first time I've, uh, start thinking about showcasing work when people start like, Hey, how much would you sell that for? I don't know. I never thought about it because I just do it because I love doing it. But then the pandemic happened and then you start spending more time doing it. But then you start seeing these opportunities pop up like small art walks and people want to be outside because it's like, I've been forced to be inside. They lock down all the parks. Yeah. So now people are just like, ah, oh, finally an opportunity to go see something. And the next thing you know, people are like, wow, these are, these are great. And they want to buy them. And it's just like, okay, then maybe I should start expanding my inventory and, and doing more of this because now there becomes a want for it as well. And I just always tried to make sure I had a good price range, different scales, not just this one thing. Like all I have is this glass. It's like, <laughs> yeah, but what if I only got room for this? Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Now I got that. What about this one? 
So I just always tried to have a variety of things because not everybody can walk away with something they have to fit in their trunk. Sometimes you just want something you can walk away in the bag, but really that pandemic kind of started it. And yeah, uh, I remember one time I'm going to some kind of art to walk or somewhere. I can't remember where the, but all the paintings were like the size of my t like really big, right? Yeah. Like I'm thinking to myself, everyone here drove a car, right? Yeah. There's no way this these big pieces of art can fit in someone's car, right? Yeah. And, and they're trying to sell like right then, like okay, like this doesn't make any sense. Yeah. It's it's one of those things where there are some like I did the uh, Redmond Art Festival. Mm -hmm. um, done that twice. I did it last year and this year. And there are some people where all of their paintings are basically the size of this TV. So they all about 24 by 36 or 30 by 40. That's all they have. Just the originals. They all $2,500. And that's it. Yeah. And I've watched them for three days, not move anything. And they have, they have, they have no delivery plan. And see, it's on you. That, and that's the thing. Like, for me, I tell people, like, if I sell an original, like, if you can take it now, cool. But I can work out a plan for you. Like, hey, I can drop it off for you. I can yeah. bring it to you here. And I've done that before because it's like, if it's local, I have no problem bringing it to yeah. you because thank you for your, this your support. This is big service. Exactly. And they're going to remember it. Exactly. I'm like, thank you. I can bring it to you. Tell me a location you would like it. I'll make sure I'll wrap it up for you. I'll put it in bubble wrap put it in a box and I'll bring it right to you. But that's why I try to make sure that I have a variety of, of, of um, different sizes. Mm -hmm. I have a variety of pricing as well, because I don't want to be that person sitting out there with nothing but originals yeah. that nobody can walk away with. You ain't got no other, no other options. Yeah. All right. Imagine going into a shoe store. All they got is one color. You like, yeah. Yeah, I'm good. And, it's, and you were a size 10. Oh, you should have got a size five. Oh, like a five, 20. size five in red. You like, yeah. who is it? All right, man, I'm out. It's like you got no variety for me. I got nothing I can walk away with. So, hey, man, I pull a Denzel on you real quick. I'm, <laughs> hey, I'm leaving out here with something. <laughs> I'm leaving with something. Yeah, you ain't got to get the big one. You're going to get one of these small ones, a couple small ones or something. But you, thank you for your pay. Thank you. Appreciate that. So how does how do you go get about getting getting like your art? How do I get an accept like these art shows, right? Is a process you have to pay, you have to be known. Like, how does that work? Usually there's going to be a call for art. You can find call for arts in different cities if you're looking for, and I mean by local, like within your driving range. Like if you don't want to drive three, four hours, that's fine. But you can find them in other cities if you're willing to drive there. But usually there's going to be a call for art. There's usually always going to be some sort of registration fee or booth fee. Like the registration fee or application fee is one thing. That's usually the cheap part. Maybe 30, 40 bucks. But then if it's like an art show, art exhibition, art festival, there's usually going to be a booth fee. And that's usually going to be a couple hundred dollars depending on where it's at. Like you do something that's smaller, maybe a hundred bucks, 200. But then if you do something like the Bellevue Arts Museum Art Fair, Six, seven, eight hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, two thousand, depending on the size of your booth. Three days, but then you could probably make that money back and some, like triple it, depending on, like I said, how good you are. Do you have to give them the cut of your, of your what you sell to, or is this a booth fee? Um, some places do require like a ten percent. Okay, but a lot of them, they just the booth fee is is good enough. You get a ten by ten space. Like they usually lay it out pretty well. And then there are a couple of pages that I use. Um, I use Vala, which is one V-A-L-A. I use their site. Um, and um, they're, they're like located in Redmond. Uh, Zap, their, their forms are called Zapplications. Like Zap is the website, Z-A-P-P. -P, and then I use Cafe. Those two are built specifically for exhibitions and art festivals. And you can go by city, you can go by zip code and you can find all of those things within your, your area. So I use one specifically for art festivals and the other one, it has more art exhibitions and festivals. So you can find them and then you can find out which ones are best for you. So if you do photography, you can look for ones that's specific for photographers and go from there. So I always try to send those links to people I know, like, hey, check these sites out because you might find a couple in Port Orchard. Might find some in Bremerton. Might find them in Anacortes. Not it doesn't have to be in Seattle. We'd be like seventieth annual Bremerton Art Festival. You like seventh? I ain't never even heard of you, yeah. man. So it's like 
sometimes you want to venture out and, and put yourself in those places because they probably never seen nothing like you before. Is there, have you done any art shows outside the Seattle area? Uh, the only ones that I usually do is usually going to be like, like Redmond and maybe like in Tacoma. Like I haven't went too far, but not, not nothing, the, nothing out of state. Or no, not, not, not out of state yet. Like there's some in Oregon that I really want to do. But like I said, that's something you got to prepare for mm. because one, those are like three day art festivals. Mm. So that means you got to think about hotel. Then you got to pay the booth fee, which may be a couple hundred bucks. So you're going to come out of pocket a few hundred dollars before you even sell anything. So it's one of those things you got to prepare for. Like 20 bucks a gallon for gas. That's what I'm saying. So it's like planning a vacation. Like it's got to be something that you got to be thinking about be months in advance. In. Exactly. You got to be very locked in. You got to be ready for that. And that's just one thing out of probably a dozen yeah. things that pop up to you as well. And you got to be willing to say no to some of these other things because yeah. One of my mottos is can't be everywhere. Yeah. So how do you do that? How do you say no to people? Because I think a lot of people, entrepreneurs, they they say yes to everything when they finish. Right? How do you like like know what the right thing is to say yes to or what to say no to? I honestly I'll start looking up what they do. I'll look it up what they do. Hopefully they have some social media. I'll look up their websites. I'll look and see if there's anybody that's done the events that I know. And I ask them questions about it as well. What was their experience like? I try to look up videos. I'll go on YouTube and look up and see if there's any videos that a civilian took, if there's any videos that an artist took, just to, so I can canvas it as well. Like I try to put myself in that position because I don't want to just go there unaware. It's like I like to know before I get there. Um, and then honestly, like I said, I can't be everywhere. I have to try to figure out which ones are going to be worth my time. And honestly, you're going to take a couple of L's. You're going to take some L's because you don't know until it actually happens. You may be like, all right, let me try this Anacortis Art Festival. And you go up there and you just like crickets. It's boring. It's it may be slow. It may be one of those. It may be a weekend where the weather turns on you. You just like, God darn, I paid four hundred dollars and it's raining the whole weekend. It's just it just may end up like that. So you just never know if it's one of those things where everything lines up. Weather's right. Good. But then it's like maybe it's not promoted well maybe you know and honestly sometimes it could just not be your time and i look at that as well like they're successful over here but over here nobody was feeling me so maybe i don't come back to this one next time you know sometimes you just gotta you gotta go through that as well i've i've seen that happen to people and then they try to talk to you and you almost got to console the artist mm -hmm. in a way you know encourage them like hey don't pick up trust me Sometimes you just got to wait to that uh, next day. What is like the local Seattle, like black art scene? Like, is there like, like black art festivals going on? Like what's mm -hmm. the black arts community like here? Honestly, the, the black arts community is, is much bigger and deeper than probably gets advertised like that. Like I said, like last night was a, a few uh, exhibitions that was going on at Slip. Um, that during the art walks through and during the Pioneer Square art walks through and the Belltown art walk. Um, make sure this thing is. Um, so you had that those going on. You have places like uh, Black Arts Love, those markets. You got places like um, Black Night Market in Tacoma. Uh, that's you know by Mari. You have um, CD Art Walk. Um, and then you have also you know, Black Love Market, that's out of Renton, you know, so it's like you have different facilities, like even one that I'm a part of as well, uh, Cultivate the Collect. Um, we have an art boutique based out of the Bellevue Arts Museum. It's like 30 plus Black artists, artisans, so they, they sell art out of that shop and we man it all ourselves. Like we have a schedule that each artist does at least one day a month. Got enough of us that we can do it. Um, and you just try to, you know, continuously promote those things. So people throw, have these different events um, that pop up in Seattle and Tacoma. Um, and, and it's like, everybody will, will definitely show up and support. But I think the thing that that you start seeing them trying to do more is trying to get into those internal systems 
like, you know, the art commissions in Seattle mm -hmm. and Renton, because a lot of those commissions be run by old white women. And it's like, they'll give the funding to a bluegrass band. And you just be like, y'all, so y'all going to do the same stuff that you did the last 20 years. But we got some ideas for some things, for some vibrancy, for some diversity, since that's the big thing. So it's like, we want to bring in more, but you want to keep doing the same old, same old, like it's a Lions Club or a Rotary Club ass type of uh, event. You just like, come on, man. Everybody look like Barbara Walters out <laughs> here. You don't want nothing different. So you end up having to, you know, keep supporting each other. Keep, you know, uh, you have events that's like Emoja Fest, you know, Black Wall Street in uh in Seattle that happens usually during May on like 23rd and Jackson. So you have these events. Well, you'll have a hundred vendors, thousands of people come out, music, food, you know, everybody just comes out in good faith and love and shop with one another. And people come out there to purchase, you know, purchase your wares, purchase your art, purchase your clothing, your your artisan. So you may make candles, you may make watches. Like it's a lot, it's real thick. You know, it's just one of those things where you have to always continuously try to promote it and always try to continuously get those allies that are in spaces that you're not in yet, like the galleries, like the museums, because you may go into a spot and you're like, this is real sterile. This is real kind of boring. Hey, have you ever thought about doing this? You know, like there's a lot of artists that would love to get in these venues. How, how about have you ever thought about something like this? And then they'll start like, oh, we've never done that before. No kit. Like, <laughs> it's the same type of art on the walls all the time. Like, it's time to funk it's it like, up. What's like, what's it, I mean, it's, up. Like, it's like same Rockefeller art. Huh? You, the same Rockefeller art, you know, back in the day. The, yeah. The prairie people and all that kind of stuff. Correct. It's, it'd be the same stuff. And you just like, come on, man. It's, it's got to be something, you know, something more. So these art shows, from your point of view, do they do, do do they do a good enough job internally promoting all these shows they have? Like the Anacortes, make this up the Anacortes art show. Do you think those people do enough good enough job like promoting it everywhere? Or they or they leave the artists to, to promote it? The when these art shows happen, especially like these festival exhibitions, it it's honestly becomes both the the events they promote it, and then they of course lean on the artist to promote. The artist always got to promote because the artist wants people that they know to come out if they can as well. Um, and some of these institutions have been around for a long time. So it's almost like they ain't got to do much now. Yeah. So it's really on the artist. Like, like I said, the, like a Bellevue arts festival, it's been around for like 80 years. Yeah. They don't really have to do much. People come looking for them because it's 300 artists out here. So they, people already know they kind of get it. Once you start seeing the banners fly up, people know, Oh, this is happening in two weeks. I will be out here to, to, to look at it and check it out, even if I'm not buying anything. But it's the ones that haven't been around as long. That's when you know that you got to do a lot of foot traffic because you're not in their inner circle. You may follow them on Facebook or Instagram or something like that. So you may see a post, but you don't know exactly what they do. Um, as far as the marketing aspect, you don't you don't know if they're putting it on radio. You don't know if they if it's online. You don't know if it's going to be on TV. You don't know if it's in the newspaper, The Stranger, Seattle Times. You just hope that they're promoting it. So that's why you always have to do your own due diligence because you can't follow them every second and figure out how. Like they'll tell you when you're signing up, we're going to do these type of media blast. And you're like, you'll. If they're big enough, you'll trust it because you're like, well, you've been around for 20 years doing this festival. So you've been doing something right. So, okay. But you still have to do your due diligence just because you hope that they're doing that. So with artists, is it more, is it like a competition between, between artists? Like, you know, my painting's better, my color's brighter, or is it more collaborative? It's more collaborative. There are some gatekeepers. Honestly, there are some gatekeepers that don't want to hip you to techniques. Uh, and things like that. They'll just kind of like brush it off. But the majority of the time is more collaborative. So you're going to find a whole lot more artists that are like, yeah, man, like if you talk to them, like, man, I'd love to work with you. Like you got a lot of them that'll be like, yeah, man, that'd be awesome. Like here's, you know, take my information or I give them a card or something like that. Or even if you're doing an event, 
you know, you're all supporting each other, you know, at each other's tables, talking to each other, um, sharing information, things like that. They may let you know, like, hey, we got this thing going on in two weeks. Man, you should come out and network with us. Or like, we got this thing we're putting on, man. Let me get your information, man. I love for you to, you know, be one of our art vendors, you know, come set up a table. So it's like, it's more of that going on because you're going to win more when you work together. But there are some, I, I'll still never forget, like there are some that are, um, you ask them about a technique or where they got something from. Like, man, I've been looking to do this, man. I've been looking to get into this. Could you, man, where did you get that from, man? How, where did you find how to, you know, get these manufactured? Well, you know, you know, I got my sources and you just like, yeah, I know that. So I'm asking you, but they don't want to do that because they think you're going to steal something from them. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I don't even live anywhere near you. I see you every once in a while. We don't really run in the same circle. So if you're thinking about competition like that, your style is not my style. The people that shot with you, they may shot with me too, but they shot with me for something different than what you got. You know, it's like going to Target and then Walmart. It's like, yeah, they practically got the same thing, but they may have something over here that Walmart didn't have. Yeah. So it's still supporting the same type of thing. They still, they still stores, you know, but you're definitely going to find a lot more people working together. You know, they make different collectors of artists or um, even if you see artists that like my man, Myron, Myron Curry, beautiful, dope artist, beautiful muralist, got murals all over the goddamn place. And I mean, big ones, most humble dude ever. But if you start asking him questions, he going to give you all the information you could possibly need because he want you to win too. He's not like, ah, you know, <laughs> I got secret. No, he's going to be like, hey, man, yeah, all you got to do is this. Or I'm like, well, how do you scale it up? How do you do this? He'll tell you all these different tips and tricks that he's used before. Some of them work for you. Some of them don't. But he's giving you information. He can't be you. He can't hold your hand and do it. But he's giving you as much information he can possibly give you so you can at least attempt it or get an When you get an opportunity, now you can, oh, I remember you said this, you know. And that's what it takes, you know? I do techniques in my art that other artists don't use, or I mix mess with mixed media stuff that other artists don't use. And they like, man, I don't even know how you, I ain't never used that stuff before. And I'm like, I show you how to do it. It's really easy. But it's that fear of messing up your work. It's like, I spent a lot of time on this. I don't want to jack it up. And I'm like, trust me, I can show you how to do it. I can walk you through it. It'll be all good. That's what it takes to keep it going, you know? Can't just be like, Man, just go online. You'll figure it out. It's like, no, nah, man, I'll come over to your place if that's what it takes, bro. Like, I want you to win, yeah. you know? What are some artists, like, either alive or maybe even dead that, like, inspired you? Um, It's funny because this this is something that I talked about in one of my uh, my classes this, this week as well. Um, Like, growing up, like, I never had any real, like, uh, major inspirations that I could think of. I just was doing what I did and drawing how, how I drew. But like when it came to like comics, Todd McFarlane, creative spawn. I loved how he, I loved his dynamic, even his static images. It looked like it was just going to jump out at the page. Like he has so much detail. And that was the thing that always got me. Like he, he would make, everything looked like it could be touched just by putting little lines and etchings and things because he, he put so much little detail in his things. He made things look old. It made things look textured, but it's like, I loved his de attention to detail. And so I always tried to remember that stuff when I drew, um, I would say, uh, this painter from, um, from Philly, Justin, uh, Wadlington, the blind eye artist, like he's blind in one eye. He got into an accident as a kid, but he makes me think about how I create pieces, but especially when it's going to be something that has layers to it, he makes me think about what each layer does and how it matters to the overall image because everything tells a story. Like if it's just going to be a simple background, cool, but if this thing has got like, this character and this character and this character, how do they all make sense in the scope of this one thing? How does this background not just be a background, but it also has clues 
inside the major painting as well to where it all flows together. And you're just like, man, that's, it, that's just like ridiculously uh, dope for me because it's not enough for it to be dope. It also has to speak to you as well. It also has to have a message. It has to, you know, have layers and volume to it as well. You want to look at it and just be like, dang, I ain't catch that the first time. Like you go back and look at it. I see what you did there. Oh, that's what that means. It's like it's things like that 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 really uh that really gets you. Um and, and then even the the local artists that I be around a lot, um, like my man, you know, Rodney King, um, uh, like I said, Myron, um, mm-hmm. uh, Mama Lips, Jess, like these are all different artists that all have their own style. And they all think about and research their art in a specific way as well. Like my man Rodney literally will have his notepad. And he'll be writing down ideas for his paintings. He'll be reading through books and looking through old magazines to make these concepts come to life as well. You know, and it's just like that's what it takes if you want your stuff to mean something and you want it to be yours. You know, you don't want it to be cookie cutter. Oh, it has to has to have something about it that's that's you is there like a scientific term for this like like uh, sometimes i'll go to like a museum or art museum uh-huh. you walk around you're looking yeah whatever whatever and then like you're walking like it's almost like your head turns to a painting like it almost draws you in right is there yeah. a term for that or something like something that's catchy like I you mean, already passed the catchy eyes like you, you don't know what it is like I something mean, about that painting or sculpt yeah. like grabbed you so to speak you know all i can think of is law of attraction yeah maybe that is what law of attraction yeah that's the only thing i could think hey, you've of they're saying like you were somewhere walking around nothing really mm-hmm. catch you out then all of a sudden like bam yeah and then you stand like 20 30 minutes like like just admiring it right yeah i've done that before and you just sit there and just like damn you're trying to figure out what the artist wanted to do with this what's this mean the well, angles yeah, like i've done that um Hindi wiley like his pieces are like world renowned now it, but I stare at his stuff because I'm like is this paint because you're just looking at it like how did you get these this thing so smooth mm-hmm. like is this background painted like what did you do first uh-huh. like it's because his stuff interweaves the background with the foreground and you mm-hmm. just like what is going on here and you just find yourself looking at these things and you just like I gotta step it up yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. You're looking like, man. What am I doing? I gotta do so. I gotta do I'm, something. I'm here just fucking man. around, right? Oh man, I'm amateur hour right now. I gotta oh my game goodness, up. I'm up here and I'm like, uh, um, okay. I'm not. I'm not doing. I'm not pushing myself enough. It's like, yeah. that's yeah. I know what you mean. You, you walk into these spaces and you just like, God darn. So this ain't the same thing, but um, it was on YouTube sometime, man. I think it was uh, Chris Rock and someone else. I think it was Chris Rock and Kevin, uh, man, what's that guy? Kevin Hart, right? Mm-hmm. There comes kind of comedy show, and they was, hey, we're both gonna do a comedy show, right? And let's take notes, let's compare each other. So they did a little 10 minute comedy show, and mm-hmm. Dave Chappelle came on next, right? Mm-hmm. Dave Chappelle came on, did a show. Look, Kevin Hart and Chris Rock are like, what the fuck are we doing, right? Yeah. We're, 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 like, they took notes of like, we're like, we're amateur hour compared to Dave. Why, why are you even comedians, right? Yeah. That's, I think it's good to have someone like that above you, like strive for, right? It's like uh, Kings of Comedy. Yeah, like everybody knew like Bernie Mac was gonna close because you like, yeah. you can't let him go first. No, no. Like I'm, you don't I know I'm, I know I'm DL. I know I'm said to the you, you don't want to follow Bernie Mac, but you can't follow somebody like Bernie. He gonna suck all the life out the air. Yeah, like, just there's nothing left. Everybody is done, and you come out there. Hey, how y'all doing tonight? I said, Boo. how y'all? Boo. <laughs> I think it honestly. We want Bernie. We want Bernie. I think one of my favorite comedians, like Bill Burr. Mm-hmm. I think oh, it. I think it'd be you know the same. Coming, way. You know he's coming to Tacoma. I think next month. I, I think I, he's gonna be. Yeah, he's gonna be down at the. the no, Emer- Emerald, Emerald Queen Casino. Emerald yeah. Queen. Yep. Yeah. I think see, I want to see him so bad. I, I think so that'd be the same thing. Like yeah. you come up behind Bill, you like. No. He's already done all the damage. Yeah, he's and just like, hey, how y'all doing this yeah. evening? He's talking oh. about every every political thing, everything you know. I love I just I love his sarcasm and I love the fact that he's he's such a contrarian to the point where it's like even he'll laugh at yeah. it. You just like yes. Yeah. It's yeah, Bill is definitely the dude, man. Yeah. I love his comedy. I love his comedy style. Yeah. And that he just like he's one of my things that I like is like 
I'm I always say I'm not obligated to say yes. Uh -huh. And so Bill is that way because he's <laughs> like, I don't yeah. have to say yeah. yeah. I don't have to like it just because yeah. you like it. Exactly. Everybody else likes it. It's like, it ain't for me. Yeah. I'm a big fan of Bear Bar. He's awesome. to be so funny. He is. F is for family. <laughs> <laughs> that that I was like, come on, you gave Bill Burr cartoon. Come on, man. <laughs> That was that was it right there. Like, come on. Yeah. I love it. So what does the term original spur come from? Does that what does that mean? Does that have significance to it? Yeah. Yeah. When I was getting to that point where I was thinking about creating an art business, you know, some of these, like I said, some of these festivals and things, you have to have an LLC for it. And so I'm trying to come up with a name. And honestly, every name that I was coming up with, oh my goodness, it was on some. I was just trying to find something cool. It ain't had nothing to do with me. <laughs> it was just like, I just I wanted something cool. And then it's like anytime I would talk to my sister, she 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 calls me by my name, but she don't. She'd just be like, hey, Spur, what you up to? And so that term comes from my great grandmother, Mary. She used to always uh like when my pops was at work, we'd be at my great grandmama or my grandmama house. In Mississippi, and she'd be she was like the the family babysitter. I'm mm -hmm. like, why are you the oldest woman? Because she's the only one that's at home. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't listen. So I'd be hard headed or something, and, and I'd talk back or something. And, and then she'd be she'd say something to me and be like, "Old oh, spurhead," <laughs> you know, because you know your, your hair's unkept, your hair ain't brushed or nothing. So she'd just be like, "Old oh, spurhead," and so. It just became a term that she would use because I wouldn't listen. And then anytime a, a child is born in a black family, you're going to automatically get a, a little nickname. Oh, look at the little dumpling. Oh, look at the little stink. And my sister would always be, would always be, oh, look at the little spur. But then she'd be like, but that's the original spur. There you go. That go the original spur right there because she knew too. Like my great grandmother would call me spurhead. Um, and then it just kind of clicked. It was like, I'm trying way too hard. And then I was like, the original spur. I'm looking it up. I'm like, nothing out there like that. I'm like, cool. Cause I'm like, cause there's only one. So it would always be something like that. And that was. It, it brought me back because I was like, yeah, that goes back a long way. I'm like, my great grandmother <laughs> was the one that gave me that name. So anytime I sign my paintings or my art, if you look at it, it's always an SH mm -hmm. uh, in a style that I do it. Cause yeah, that that's, a, that's a great story. That. That's a great original story. Yeah. You know, and cause I'm like, that goes back all the way back to my great grandmother. And like I said, my sister still called me that. She still called me Spur. Hey, Spur, what's up? So we're going back to art in a minute, but mm -hmm. you were in the, in the in the army. Yeah, I was in the I joined the uh, the army guard. I was seventeen because I was living in a small town in Mississippi. We had moved back to Mississippi from Alabama. It was like from Mississippi, moved to Alabama for some years, and then we moved back to um, Mississippi. Like when I was a you know tenth grade or something like that. And I'm living in a small town, like literally it's one of them drive through town, like one stop like type of town. They had a little bit of a downtown, a Texaco gas station. And it's like, there are no job opportunities unless you got a car and you can drive into Hattiesburg, which is the next biggest city. By biggest city, I mean maybe 50,000. So, <laughs> so it's like, got no car. Brother got a car, but he out there in the street, he's gone. He, and it's like, got no way to get a job, like really, in this little town. So the people that's working there have been there probably 15, 20 years. You ain't coming in there at 16 to get no job. So it was like, I, turned, I was 17, and it was funny because me and a bunch of other, my friends and stuff, always looking at the military. And so, you know, they come around, and you take the ASVAB, and in school, I don't even know if they still do that, but you take the ASVAB and you pass it or, and they get your score and they tell you what jobs you would qualify for. So it was like an opportunity. I looked at it like, man, they're going to pay me to work out. You know, I just looked at it, but it was better than doing something illegal because that's the other option I could have took. You feel me? It's like, there's plenty of opportunity for that, but I'm like, I would, I didn't want to disappoint my moms. And it's like, well, 
come from a military family anyway. My pops was a veteran and, you know, he served in Vietnam, Desert Storm. Um, my older brother, Red, he was in the Air Force for about 10 years. It's like, you know, so that was the opportunity. How many years did you do? Eight. Eight, okay. Yeah. I did the contractual eight. I was yeah. like. Not a I, day less, not a day more. Nah, I got out in 2009 before I moved uh, up to Seattle. Um, but yeah, it was it was just an opportunity because, like I said, I, I didn't have a lot of opportunities for me, but I had option to make. I could have went left or right, and I chose to go left, which was the military. That way I could actually still be in school, and I could still make some money, and I didn't have to go do nothing stupid, really stupid, illegal to do it, you know? And what was your job in the military? I go a 45 Bravo, which was an armorer. Okay. Yeah. Uh, worked with, worked on weapons primarily. Making sure. I, I'm used to hate armorers. I mean. They just make it, motherfucker, I, I can eat off this weapon. What do you mean it's not clean? But so the trip thing is, I ain't even really do too many weapon things yeah. because I was in a maintenance company. So okay. we fixed every damn thing. Okay. You so, worked on everything. I found myself, I was on more tanks. So you're, so you're a real armor. You want like one of the supply people, they put in the truck to arm you. Nah, they, that's the thing. It's like, yeah, I was an armor. So if something happened, they could bring it to me. Okay. I was thinking wrong. I was thinking about the supply person. You turn the weapons in, they give the weapons. Uh, I had, I did that every once in a while. Like since that was, they was like, you know, they'd get me to come in there, but mostly I worked on whatever's in the field. Okay. So I worked on the heavy wheel Worked on the tanks. Okay. Like I worked on whatever we that we had out there with us, which usually was gonna be what everybody else was working on. Um, strikers, hummers, things like that. Okay. It wasn't even, yeah, they weren't finna let you just be sitting in a cage <laughs> and doing nothing. Ah, yeah, we need you out here uh, at this motor pool. Yeah. <laughs> it's fucking, like nah. fucking motor pool. Oh my goodness. I know, right? It's like certain terms you just you ain't yeah. gonna hear nowhere. I said it came me like every Monday maintenance, like Nothing's changed. The shit ain't moved, you know? Like, yeah. It's, take, take, or take this, take that. And it's funny because all those vehicles been around since like World War II. Yeah. Deuce and a half, five tons and stuff. Yeah. And they all got push start. I'm like, why did it take so long for the civilian world to get pushed to start? Yeah, I know. Like, if they had these trucks in World War II and all you had to do is flip a switch and yeah. press a button, why ain't they been here? And, and, and they thought it was the best thing ever. I mean, all you had to do was lock the steering wheel. Yeah. But it's like, it's pretty damn ingenious. Flip, bam, and you're done. You got to wait to like 2015 here to get a push start Ultima. you like, yeah. Um, but um, after you came back from the Iraq, you got, you got PTSD, right? Yeah, so I just didn't know. Thumb. I didn't like, know. How did you find out you had it? Um, Honestly, just myself. Mm -hmm. Just self actualization man like i never went to a therapist i never did any of that stuff what do you think like caused it any, any triggering action you think caused just like coming to effect of being in the military and being like on these deployments just day to time i suppose okay. it was just just being exposed to something it's just like secondhand smoke mm -hmm. being exposed to it long enough yeah. eventually you start changing the way you do things yeah. because like i never had this illusion that I wasn't in a in a place where I could just not be in danger for mm -hmm. one, or I, I had to be someplace where I could just treat it like I was back home, or even at a base in Mississippi or something yeah. like that. It's like, no, you're in a totally different environment, and you have to act according to where your environment is. Mm -hmm. Like, if you get sent to a maximum security prison, it ain't jail. No. Now you got to act like you're in a maximum security yeah. prison. So it's like when you go overseas and you in Iraq and whatever base you go to, it's like it don't take you long to realize like when you go outside, you just like, yep, I'm this, you know, yeah. this is not where you yeah. were before. I'm not playing a war game on PlayStation. You're not right playing, now. you're not this playing that shit. stuff. It's like you here, so now you gotta really be in the mindset that all that stuff you see on CNN. All these attacks and oh, 90 people were killed in a car bomb at a cafe. And you just like, and I gotta be at the front gate searching cars. Yeah. If it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. Yeah. So you have to get in your mind, you gotta get out of your head being afraid. You just gotta not care. Yeah. And so you gotta be at to a point like do your job and hopefully you get to go home at the end of the night. Yeah. But you can't be out there 
scared and fearful. It's like you just got to be on point and you got to go through this this motion and and just be thinking like if it was going to happen. I yeah. probably wouldn't even feel it or I'd probably be like in so much shock that yeah. I don't have legs yeah. that my body ain't caught up to the fact that you're dead already. Yeah. So it's like you just got to get out of your mind and then you go back and go into the de facto or something mm-hmm. and there's on TV mm-hmm. and it's just on news and you're just like, huh, so who else died? And you just like, you just become numb. Yeah, you come numb to desensitize. Yeah, you become desensitized. You just like, okay, well, I'm going to go to the gym. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go to the internet cafe and... You know, if you got that at that base, I'm going to go there and listen to some music or go to the USO and watch a movie or play some video games because you just don't even, it doesn't bother you, Yeah. you know? And that's who I had become. I became, you know, and I had to become a certain way while I was there. Like, I almost made a really bad mistake. I would have been in probably prison for the rest of my life. Like, just because I almost snapped on a battle buddy, if you will. He wasn't a part of our unit, but you know, when you're doing certain duties, guard duties, front gate, prison guard duties, you be with other people from different units. And so you might have two or three of your guys and they may have two or three of theirs and so on. So it's like, I don't know you like that. And they kept a vehicle come on like the Iraqis that work on the base. They probably just come in to clean the toilets. They probably come to dump out the old water and put new water so you can take a frigger shower. And they kept messing with this kid, you know? They kept messing with this kid. And literally, he was like maybe 14, 15. But he was with the older person. And they kept messing with him, like, you know, abusing their authority, pushing them and, you know, knocking them down to the ground. And I remember helping them up off the ground. And I remember, like, snapping, like, cursing, like, literally cursing them and cursing my people out because I'm like, y'all sat there and didn't do nothing. Like I was like an inch away because I carried a 249 saw. So that is, you know, a big machine gun with a uh, 200 round drum yeah, belt. has some power behind it. Yeah. And I was like, my finger was really itching. I really had to pull myself back because I was about to shoot this fool because he was being so stupid and nobody was going to say it was saying anything to him. And I really had to pull myself back from that edge. Good, good decision, right? <laughs> really good decision. So I just, I just chose to use my words. I helped them up. They, they went on about their way, and I just chose to use my words because I almost made a terrible mistake. But then when I came back home after that year, like I didn't realize you, you know, you have people that's telling you you changed, you know, because I was very short. I wouldn't say short temper because I don't get angry. I get more annoyed than anything, but I was real quick to just be like, this shit is stupid. Like, what is this? Like, people, y'all complaining about this. You know, I just been, y'all complaining about this. Like, I'm not trying to hear that, but I was that way with my family. So I was very short with my family. I was, uh, you know, very much, you know, had indifferent. I just didn't care, you know, because I was numb. You know, who I was was not the person that I, you know, that I was before I went to Iraq. And so I didn't realize it. But like I said, you know, once you, you hear it the first time, you like, whatever. You hear it two times, maybe there's something to it. But then you keep hearing it, that you've changed, that you've changed. One, you don't really believe it. And then two, you get tired of hearing it. You get tired of hearing that you've changed and you've changed. So it took me some time to changed that person because I was back home. Um, and I couldn't treat my family like that. I couldn't be short with them. I couldn't disrespect them because of whatever I had going on upstairs. And so I, it just really took a lot of willpower to just start chipping away at that. But then I dealt with a lot of depression after that. And didn't even real, once again, didn't realize it was depression because I was fighting who I had become to become something better because I was depressed that I couldn't be who I was before Iraq. Cause the person I was before Iraq, I was in college working on an art degree. And then I had everything lined up had my plan of action. And then you get that call. Yeah. We just got activated, man. What you doing? Calling me, man. What? I remember that it was summer. They called me. I was so upset. 
But then they was just like, you know, just uh, stand ready. You know, we might be getting an actual call, but I'm going to find out some more information. I right, duck, man. A man, 20 ducks worth. I was like, all right, man. I was upset because I knew I was going to have to drop out of school. What college were you going to? I was going to Jones College. It's in Laurel, Mississippi. It was a junior college. It used to be called Jones County Junior College, but now it's just Jones College. There was a movie that came out with Matthew McConaughey, Free State of Jones. Some some couple years ago, that takes place in Jones County, which is where Laurel is. Um, that story, but I will have my plan. I'm gonna do my prerequisites, get all get that out the way at, at Jones College, and then go finish up at University of Southern Mississippi. Get me like a degree in advertising or graphic design. Like that was my plan because I always looked at it like I don't want to be ripping and running all over the campus. I'm gonna go here, finish everything my prerequisites, get that associates go over there. And I finished a year, and before I could uh, start that next one, that's when I got that call, that stand ready. And then maybe a couple, maybe two weeks later, I got the real call, like, all right, we being activated. Got to be here at the base this time. And I was, by that time, I was just like, all right, man, where I need to be, what time? And right, I'll be there. I wasn't even upset no more. I just... Stopped, started, I packed everything that I needed to, and I got to where I needed to be so we could start training. But because it was nothing that could be done, there was no way out of it. It was re- it was like realizing you just have to, you can't fight against this, this riptide. You just kind of have to let it take you and just be like, all right, you know. But I was that person. I loved that person. Then I became somebody else. And then after Iraq, I was fighting against that because I was trying to get that person back, but not realizing you have to evolve again. You have to shift again. You have to become a different person again. You know, you can't go back and get that person, but what you can do, you can take aspects of that person. Cause that person is still inside you. You can take aspects of that person. You can combine it with what you are and you can create something new. So it's like, cool. I still take lessons from mm-hmm. things that I learned in the military but I still hold on to who I was before that. And it's like, cool, I can make the best of both worlds and I can make it work, you know? Um, and it was, it was not easy because I was really like, that was a real internal struggle trying to get that person back and prove that I ain't changed, you know, trying to prove that to other people and myself that I haven't changed. And it's like, you got to realize like, dude, you have changed. You kind of been through some stuff for the last year and a half. <laughs> Yeah. Cut off from people like that. You ain't, it ain't been normal for you for a long time, you know? So are you happy with the person you are right now? Very much so. Very much so because, man, I've had to shift a few times since then, but very much so happy with who I am because now I know who I am and what I will and won't accept. Um, when I look back and think about the things that I accepted as far as in, in relationships and dealing with people as well, man, it was a whole lot of rolling over, a whole lot of, you know, oh, go along to get along, you know? And it's just like, yeah, I'm not a big fan of that now. It's like, well, you disappointed or you don't like it. Okay, that's fine. I'm not obligated to say yes. And I'm not obligated to go along with you just because you want it this way. One of my favorite lines from The Wire, you want it one way, but it's the other way. (laughs) You know, it's like, nah, because I also can be happy as well. I can be happy in my life as well. I don't have to be miserable to make you happy, you know. And are you still struggling with PTSD and depression? If you are, are you like doing any therapy, taking any medicine? How are you dealing with that if you're still Um, working with it? No, no PTSD issues, man. Like I said, I really worked through a lot of that. It took some time to work through those things. For me, I think the thing that really helped me was getting back into art, which didn't, between, after Iraq and the time up till I moved here, it's like, I did art a little. Like, when I went overseas, I really didn't have time to be, I drew some. Like, I still have drawings that I did in 2005 that I have at home. Um, and I kept that of original characters and things like that. But I really got, when I was there, I got more into writing because that's really the only thing I had time for. I didn't have time to sit there and concentrate on a drawing. So 
writing kind of became a little bit more um, something to focus on. Um, but then once I came back home, once I got out the military, it was like I didn't really, I wasn't really heavy into art like that. It would, every once in a while, I would do something. But I think it was a form of like PTSD as well because it was like a mental block. It's like I could see it, but I, it was hard for me to put it down. You know, it's like I could see the image, but it was almost like something was in the way, you know, and it took me a time. I mean, when I say time, probably like 10 years to just gradually keep going and chipping away at that. Then probably around 2019 kind of had this John Wick moment. It was like, yeah, I think I'm back because it started to flow. It was like somebody unclogged the drain and now it started to go. And next thing you know, 2020s in, and it's like, okay, now it's become easier and I can create things like I used to, you know, I can come up with ideas like I used to. Um, and that really helped me a lot because I spent so much time drawing. It's crazy. Like it's hard for me to spend a night not creating something like, Oh, I'm just going to watch a movie tonight. It's not happening. Right? Next thing you know, iPads in my hand and I'm Oh man, you supposed to been watching this movie, and 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 next you know I'm I'm trying to draw something, trying to create something to figure out what this next painting is gonna be, and and thinking of oh man, I could really do this. Oh, I need to go to Hobby Lobby because I can pick this. Up. <laughs> it's like formulating a plan on the next thing I want to do art wise instead of just relaxing. But it's like now it's hard. It's hard to shut off now. So I think for me, I'm real grateful for that. But it's like even when I feel like depression or something mm -hmm. like that kick in like I remember having a panic attack for the first time I never had that that I can remember had a panic attack didn't know what it was considered it was just one day you just feel like someone's sitting on your chest and it's because of all these little things that you have been stressing about and it's like they catch up to you and you're so worried about life so worried about this and you're just like I think I'm having a panic attack I think I'm depressed and it's almost like when you can admit that, and you're just like, okay, I know what I can do to get help for that. You know, I need to talk to somebody or I need to get this out. I can't draw this out. Like I need to get out the house, need to have a conversation with someone, but at least I know this is what I'm feeling because um, I don't think those type of thoughts really, really came as an option years ago. I don't think it was until like the pandemic when people actually had to sit down with themselves a lot more without distractions to start realizing, man, I think a couple of years ago, I felt this same. I remember feeling this way some years ago. I just didn't know what it was called. I went to the doctor and everything. <laughs> I seriously went to the doctor for something. They were like, we can't find anything wrong uh -huh. with you. But I'm it's like- It was all mental then, right? It was all mental. mental. I was like, I'm having shortness of breath. It feels like somebody's sitting on my chest. They X-raying. I don't see you're, nothing. You're, you're a perfect heart. How, Charles? They, Nothing extra, nothing MRI. Friggin' panic attack, yeah. man. But they, it wasn't nothing they could see physical, you know, but it's like, but I could feel it, you know? So it's just, now it's a lot easier to get through things now because you have, it's, it's almost like you can actually think about what's going on with you because it's like, I've experienced this before. Okay, I'm not in denial. I know what this is. I know how to, to work through this. I know how to get help for this as opposed to, I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> so, so Charles, like a lot of people when they leave the military, they struggle with PTSD, with depression, and they, most veterans struggle transitioning from the military to the civilian world. What advice can you give them? Man, it's okay to talk to people. It's okay to talk about what's going on with you. Um, without thinking that, you, without the excuse that you wouldn't understand. That's probably one of the worst excuses. Like, you just wouldn't understand. It's like, I know I don't understand, but I'm also here as a, you know, a ear if you just need to talk to somebody. I'm not here to try to give you advice about anything because I ain't been what you've been through. But I'm willing to talk with you as well, man. And if you're willing to hear a different perspective, then I'll share it as well, you know? It's like, I'll, I'll share that with you because I'm okay with that. Um, and it's like, I think that would be really helpful because I think when people have, are dealing with depression, PTSD, 
they don't want to say anything because you don't want to be ridiculed. You don't want the first thing somebody says is, man, you need to go see a, a, a therapist. And it's just like, right now, I just need somebody to talk to. I just need somebody to listen to me. And I don't feel comfortable with that being my first option, you know? And, uh, and I think that's why a lot of times people won't say anything because they immediately going to get, you're going to get diagnosed by somebody. And you're just like, sometimes you just need an ear. I need something familiar before I venture into that, you know? It's like, almost like training wheels, you know? It's like, oh, just go ahead and do it. It's just like, you don't, you don't understand that that's even more difficult. It's difficult for me to talk to you or bring this to you, but now you're telling me to go find a stranger that I don't know and I gotta pay for it. It's like, I just need somebody to listen to me just for a moment and not shut me out and tell me I need to get professional help. It's like, because then you're trying to make it sound like you are crazy. And that's the first thing you do. You need to get professional help. It's like, come on, man. Don't let that be your first suggestion. It's like, can I just talk to you for a moment? So I would definitely suggest it's okay to, to, to talk to others it's without feeling like you're going to be ridiculed, shamed. You know, sometimes you just need to get it out before you make those next steps or get those suggestions to make those next steps. Sometimes you just need to talk to somebody. Nice. Nice. Um, so I hope I, I asked this question correctly. Has there ever been a time with someone like want you to do a piece of art, mm -hmm. but it's, it was so off the wall. So it creates a word like, dude, I can't do this because I cannot be associated with anything like this, like any kind of like off the wall pain. Like it's so weird. So Atlanta's like maybe illegal pornographic, <laughs> just like something like, or like the non dynamic or whatever the case may be. We're like, Hey, I can do this, but there's no way I can sign my name with this because I, I I can't be associated with something like this. Um, I don't, I don't think that anybody has bought me something ridiculous. I think because when they start looking at my work or looking at my page, they know not to bring me something like that. Okay, so it's like, yeah, go someplace else with that because you already know if you come to me, it's like no. <laughs> it's like so I hadn't thank goodness I hadn't been brought anything off the wall that you okay. know because something like that because it's like I think your your reputation can speak for you but then people start looking at your your body of work and they can be they can assess that okay yeah this is probably something I don't think this person I even want to waste my time yeah because I'll be real quick to be like yeah no that's not gonna be okay. for me like even that that part that you said about oh I can do it but then not sign my name to it I wouldn't even just I just wouldn't even do it because if it don't sit well with me I'm okay with saying no to it okay you know so what determines if someone's success successful artist is the amount of money they get paid the um, is it internally like you know Charles Connor says I'm a, a successful artist as I say so does mm -hmm. the artist crowd say like how do artists like figure out I'm I'm successful whatever success might mean to each individual person. I think that it's going to be primarily what you think about yourself first. Um, and then the acknowledgement of others comes, can come after that because you have to look at your own work and be like, man, this is now this is it right here because you can do an exhibition and everything can be for sale. Your stuff can be on exit can be exhibited for a month and a half and you not get anything from it, but you might not get any immediate sales from that. But the fact that people like to see your work, that's an amazing mm -hmm. feeling. Like to have your work, whether it's in a gallery space, in a museum of art, anything like that at a market art festival and people come and they talk to you and just like, wow, your work. And, and you just have conversations with people whether it's the work, your inspirations, things like that, that's that's one of those feelings that you 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 know you're doing something right. You know, it's like I know I'm doing the right thing because you know the money will come because what I'm creating and what I'm doing is touching people in such a way that it can't help but to come. But if you start creating art because I gotta sell it, this gotta sell, it's gotta be for the money then you're just going to be doing some some stuff that everybody else is already doing, some cookie cutter mess that, that you've already seen before. Because you have to create the work 
based on what you feel, what you think. Like I always look at it this way. I do about 75, 80% of what I want. And then that other little, you know, 20% is what I think people will like. Cause I'm like, this is going to be dope. I already know this is going to be crazy. I'm putting this much thought into it. These little hidden things. I wonder if people are going to get it. I'll put a story behind it. And, you know, hopefully people can, can see it. But then that other 20% is be thinking like, hmm, I wonder if I put this, what people would think, man, they probably would like, Oh, they might like this, but it's like, it's got to matter what I think about it first. Otherwise, why am I creating it? I'm not, I don't want to create it because I think people are just going to like it. I want to create it because I, I like it because the success will come after that because it'll be undeniable. Does this ever happen in art? Like, you know, like in the music industry, like we'll say, um, I'll make this up. Uh, Taylor Swift does a song and Post Malone will have a, like a two couple of feature verses. Mm -hmm. And artists are like, what is that? Like one artist one draws most of the pain. The artist two comes in, like put a couple of things in there or like, a piece of art always done by only one artist. Um, well, that would be more of like a collaborative piece. Like okay. if you get well, those what a, do happen. They do happen. Okay. Like if you get with an artist and you're just like, man, we should collaborate on a piece, man. I got this idea for this piece, but I would really love for you to do the background okay. on this piece. Like you can work that out between the two artists. You can work it out and you can put it on a contract. You can put it as a handshake. You can make it verbal, but you can say, hey, man, we're going to price it like this. Whatever it gets sold for, we split it down the middle. 60, 40, whatever. It depends on how much work the other person is, is doing on it as well. So you can do that amongst artists okay. as well. Do you have any art piece of artwork you're working on now that you can talk about? That you're excited uh, about? Or yeah. That um, we have this, uh, I'm working on this, this painting right now that's only been a digital painting for, man, maybe a couple years, but it's kind of like a, one of the, a fan favorite, which is just this, beautiful black woman, chocolate sister with this massive, almost like a dark, deep, dark blue Afro. And she just has this radiant look about her, like almost like she's contemplating her eyes are closed, like she's just basking and it's called an inner glow. And it became just like this, this piece that, like I said, it's only been digital, but there's an event that's going to be coming up in January at, um, um, Thing at Bainbridge Island Museum of Art called a Radiant Reflection. And I wanted to, uh, <laughs> my homegirl Fancy, you've, uh, I think you, you did a, a, a vibe with her, but she was like, it'd be really great if you did that, if you painted that. Uh, Cause she used that for some of the advertisement, I think that's going to be coming up. And I'm like, yeah. So when got me like a, like a 30, 30 by 40, a 36 by 40 canvas, it's a nice size. Um, that way I can really let that fro, you know, pop out and be massive. And then um, it's going to be mixed media. So I know I'm going to utilize some resin. I know I'm going to utilize some glass. Because when, when this gets finished, I want people to look at it and just really be like in awe. And that's the thing, because it's like, I know I'm going to do it. I know I'm going to put everything I have into it. I want it to be beautiful. Like I've already finished her hair the skin like once i finish painting the skin and getting everything i just sit back and i'm just like hell yeah <laughs> like I, I literally sat i literally painted all day to get her to look how i wanted and then it was just like yes like all the colors everything was popping the lips look good and full. everything is is looking great and it's just like this is going to be people when they see this it's going to be amazing it's almost like this other piece that i did called Gold, uh, Golden Sight. It's um, currently on display in uh, Bellevue Museum Art, the, the shop, the gift shop, uh, the art boutique. But it's, it's, uh, it's painted, it's covered in glass, mirrored glass and resin. It was one of those type of paintings as well that everything was clicking. Like I was in such a zone, dreadlocks, all the hair was looking right, the skin, all the shadows, the contrast, everything was looking good. That's how this one feels as well. It's like it's all clicking. And so I'll have that one will be um, for an event that will take place in, in January. Okay. But I want to go, I want to go ahead and knock that so one. You're and get very it excited about those pieces. Huh? You're very excited about those pieces. I mean, exactly. Very, very much so. Because like I said, it's one of those things when everything is clicking, because there are some moments 
I call it the ugly phase when you're putting down base coats, your initial shadows and contrast, and you just sit back and you're just like, man, this is, I don't know, man. I might have made a mistake on this one. But everything is clicking. Everything's going how you envision it to go. And you can just sit back and be like, hell yeah, I did that. So when you do a piece of art, like how does it work that I suppose you're going to paint some kind of painting, right? What the concept is, mm -hmm. is it completed in your mind or you, like, in your mind, you have the final piece on your mind mm -hmm. and then paint it. Or do you like, okay, your mind is 5% done. You paint 5%, your mind's 10% and then like go back and forth. It's like completing your mind first and paint it. It's in my mind. Cause I, I have the concept of how I want it to, to go. And usually I'll have a digital representation of that on my iPad so I can see what kind of, even if it's just a, bl a base colors, I'll have the, the colors that I want. But that back and forth starts to happen as you're painting it, as you get one thing, as you get the next thing, then you start looking at like, I originally was going to do the background like this. Now I'm not sure. And then next thing you know, you've procrastinated for three, four hours and you just like, just paint it. Just paint it. You, this is how it was originally supposed to go. But you start talking yourself out of it because you think, maybe I should change it. Maybe it should be different from this. And it's like, no, this was your original plan. So that does happen quite often. Like Everything else can be going on point. And then next thing you know, you're just like. <clears throat> During the process, do you ever like bring on like, you know, peers of yours? Or, hey, I'm painting, this, I'm painting this painting. Can you come on, for, check it out for a couple hours so I can get your feedback? Or is it only like a solo individual process? It's generally a solo process, but if I do that, I just usually shoot them a picture. Okay. While I'm doing it, you know, no need for you to come out your way or something because mm -hmm. I live in Linwood and a lot of people they usually live south of me. Yeah. So usually I'm a, I send them a picture. I'll send it to to artist friends, okay. ask them what they think. Um, like some of my one of my closest friends, uh, Adrian AJ, she's in Huntsville, mm -hmm. and She's one of the reasons why I got into digital art as well, because she was using Procreate. Didn't know anything about it, never used it. But during the pandemic, I ended up, you know, getting an iPad and, use, and doing that. But she's just a phenomenal artist. And so I'll send stuff to her to get, you know, let her see it, get feedback, you know, um, just to see what people think. What do you think about this? Like, you know, if they're just like, oh, my God, it's beautiful, my goodness, or you know, curse at me because it look, it's just like, I, I, I'll send it to artists that I respect to get, you know, see what they think about it. Like, you know, if they ask me questions or if I ask them, like, you did this thing and I was thinking about doing this on the background, seeing you do something similar to that. Like, how did you do that? What did you, what did you use? Like, I try, I asked them for tips and techniques because if I'm thinking about it too much, I'm like, man, I'm finna fuck it up. <laughs> I got you. It's like you got to pull the trigger a lot of times, like especially when you're doing things with like resin. You have to pull the trigger because there's no going back once it's poured on there. It's no going back, and you got to be okay with that. You know? So next, tell the story of moving of deciding to move from Mississippi to Seattle. Uh, I, I, this has an interesting story. I tell people all the time. I tell them when they ask me, so Mississippi, huh? Like, how did you get up here? I tell them two things, an ex and scenery. Like me and my ex, we both were from Mississippi and um, was working for Forest County Justice Court, working for a court. Um, and she ended up getting a job opportunity at one of the hospitals in Seattle. And she moved, she had to move, but I was still in Mississippi. But I visited her each month, literally once a month, I'd visit for a few days. And so I kind of got the lay of the land. See how it started growing on you, so to speak. I, and see, I, I got to see it over a few months. So I got to see what winter was like, what spring was like, watch the Saints win a Super Bowl while I was up in Seattle. And, you know, it was all of that. So it was like, do the tourist thing, go to the zoo, go to the Space Needle. I'm like, okay, okay. Like, this ain't bad up here. It's not bad. I'm like, I'm actually digging it. And and it's one of those things where... You're probably like, I could do without January. I mean, <laughs> look, man, it's very... I, I look at it. It's mild up here, man. Yeah. Like, I've been to central and eastern Washington during winter. Mm, that's that's cool. winter. Yeah, that's real winter. Like, that's, that's real winter. winter. Yeah. That's toboggan sled yeah, winter. Yeah. Like this, we, don't have, we don't have real winter up here. This over here, yeah, it can be cold. It may snow every once in a while. But it's like, it's, it's mild. And you see it coming as it happens. It's not drastic like ain't really no cold snaps yeah. it's just but 
But yeah, you know, the relationship didn't work out. But I found a place for myself, moved into my own place at a six month lease. And I was like, I was contemplating going back to Mississippi. I'm like, I can get my job back there. But I was like, we'll see how I feel at the end of the six months. Mm -hmm. Then I signed another six months because the only people I knew were my coworkers. Yeah. You know, nobody else. So I'm just out here. Where were you working at then? Uh, University Bookstore. Okay. In the, in the U, I was living in the U District. Okay. I was living on 7th Avenue, right next to the off ramp okay. for the, 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 uh, the expressway. Yeah. Um, so I was living right there in the U District. And I liked it, man. Walk the gas works, mm. walk up to the stadium, walking all over campus. So I was like, most people where I'm from, when they move, they usually going to go two, three states over. They, or they're going to move. You, you move for real. Man, or they're going to go real. two to three hours. Like, they're going to be, like, when I was living in Alabama, they was, most people that I grew up with in Alabama, they're going to go to Montgomery. They're going to go to Tuscaloosa, Birmingham, Huntsville. They're going to go to Georgia. Yeah. They're going to go to Texas. Yeah. It's like, like they're the not. Like two-hour circle around the Yeah, they're going to go somewhere within a six-hour drive. Somewhere like that, you know, it's not going to be nothing su stupid drastic. But, yeah, me moving halfway across the country really is like. That's like, a real move. It's a real move. But I tell people, I'm like, I like it because you can still do all the country stuff. If that's your, if that's what you, if your yeah. bag, like my that's, man, Mike. Yeah, a lot of country living here. Mike, lo living. Mike love fishing. He loved camping with his family. He loved all, all that stuff. I'm like, you can do all of that stuff up here. Yeah. And it's, and it's super cool. And you bring a good point, right? I think so many people, they like, are like in a small town, wherever, like yeah. there's no opportunities, but they don't want to be open to the possibility of maybe moving somewhere else for a new opportunity. Right. They're like, Oh, I have to stay here. My people, my family, like mm -hmm. true, but go to, you know, like, I don't know. I don't know, North Dakota, Montana, California, yeah. Texas, you know, start over again. There's opportunities everywhere. It is. It's, and it's one of those things where it's, like I said, it has to be a real opportunity for you. And the fact that, like, when I stayed up here, they also gave some my family opportunity to come up here because my nephew moved up here a year after I did, right out of high school. Um, he stayed up here for about a year. He went back home for some college. I think he did like a semester and he moved right back up here. Now he's married with a two-year-old daughter living oh, nice. in Burien. My sister moved up a few years after that. So he started the floodgates. So yeah, so it's like since I've been up here, my mom has come up here a couple times. My nieces, you know. I guess I'll have a good time to enjoy it. Yeah, they all come like, up here. They're like, I get it, Charles. I understand why you want to be up here. I mean, because it's just, it's like, I can tell people, there's a lot in any direction you can find something you want to do or if you just want to be out and about like i love just going to the to the water mm -hmm. and just walking like i'll go down in the edmonds down to brackets landing by yeah. the ferry and just walk from one end all the way down to the, the marina and just think about what boat i would take in the event of a zombie apocalypse <laughs> <laughs> no shit right i'm just like i don't yeah. need that one that's too big yeah that's one thing too like you know we don't have your hurricanes from the up here Oh. But I know one thing, when it hits, it's going to be like a tornado. I'm mean, going to be like the earthquake, the volcano, the tsunami's going to happen at one time. We're just like, like me and my wife, we, were, like, we kind of joke around. Uh -huh. Like, like the track's bad enough for this. All this yeah. happens, we're just going to be on the front porch. I have my bourbon strap with sweet tea. We'll just have our last Greek, you know. I that honestly, when it hits, it's all dead. That's the thing. Because, like, yeah, you got hurricanes. People be like, man, I don't know how you lived. I'm like, look, you got hurricanes. If they get into the Gulf of okay, Mexico, tornadoes. if it gets into the Gulf of Mexico, it's bad news for Louisiana, Mississippi, yep. Alabama, and Florida. Yeah. If it comes how this one was, it's just bad for Florida. Yeah. Um. But like, yeah, up here, if you, one of my favorite movies, 2012 with John Cusack. Okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. If it happens, you know how many volcanoes we surrounded by? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Too many. Too we many. done. The pyroclastic cloud is just going. Yeah. It's, I mean, you got a hood. And like, and so, so I live in a town called Dupont, Washington, right? And there's like this some kind of map someone did where like they have like the if the Mount Rainier like erupts all the lava flows. Yeah. And supposedly it like goes around Dupont, right? But I'm like, okay, when is this fucking map done? Is it accurate? How you like? Were <laughs> like, you here the last time I heard New York? Like they had lava flows. Like yeah. come on now, you know. Well, like, how you know this? Oh, we built v v ravines around. Yeah, you. Like, and on. even it does go like right around your town. Like that lava is hot as fuck, right? Yeah, just heat alone. Like fucking, I don't know. And then all the ash and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And then you gotta wait for it to crust over if it crusts over yeah. to order to get away. Yeah, I'd be thinking about that stuff. I'm like, 
Hmm. The thing I know where a bunch of boats are. Yeah. Downside is if well, well, you have well, a sea yeah, quake. Well, not, well, then it's a tsunami. You're... Yeah, now you got a sea quake and now yeah. it's a tsunami. I'm like, you another gotta... terrible way to go. Yeah. And one thing too, people don't realize this either. Like, you know, like, like Seattle is, kind of, I will not say it's anti-military, but no, not really pro-military. Yeah. Only thing people in this area realize some of the military stuff is here, right? The nuclear stuff is in Bremerton, the Air Force bases. Like, I'm pretty sure we're like number one or at least top five on rest of the nuclear list, right? You know what's a trip? Because any we got Boeing if here. You think, yeah, if you think about movies, I love. Is you never recognize stuff till you move into certain areas. Yeah, like I move up here, then all of a sudden I'm like, I've seen this somewhere. Oh, Assassins with Sylvester Stallone and yeah. and Antonio Banderas. They were on the monorail. Yeah. Um, but then you think about movies, um, Alien versus Predator. They always take place in some Pacific Northwest, yep. Oregon, Washington esque. Yep. Like, yeah. come on, man. They do. There's this video game called uh, Days Gone, where it's like a, they not zombies, but they infected hordes. Mm -hmm. And it takes place Pacific Northwest. Yeah. Like, uh, which mountain okay. or, or, is, or which island, like in Oregon, is like one of, is a yeah. base because the only way you can get to it is by bridge. So yeah. they literally can cut off the bridge and be self sustained. But it's like, of course, it would take place in a Pacific Northwest. Long stretches of highway, a yep. lot of vast land. You can live off the land. And one highway, one, no, nothing else. I five. One highway. Hopefully the bridge isn't out. You just yeah. like don't have to have to go across the Columbia River. You're done. Man, after talking, I have to go to Costco after this and stock up our supplies. Oh my goodness! It's just like, yeah, you're right. It's like, yeah, we'd be a be a big target. Yeah. Oh, there's a lot of tech here. A lot of tech, yeah. A lot of tech. Boeing, Black. you know, all the nuclear submarines in Reverton, you know, all the Air Force. Yeah, versus. I was going to say, Everett got a, a, a Navy base, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Just like, yeah. It's whole, yeah. And, and, and I could be wrong. I think most average citizens here don't realize all the military stuff here. They don't have a clue, I don't think. Honestly, it's one of those things that I even forget about. All I be knowing about is JBLM. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right. It's like, I look it up. Everyone, like, I like going to... Uh, the Mohai, because mm -hmm. you know Pacific Northwest history, but then they be showing you like where all these bases and stuff. They yeah. be like, they got that's an Everett, really? Yeah, people don't realize like in the army, I think Fort Bragg's number one, Hood's two, and, and Jay Blim's the third largest base in the U.S. military. It's crazy. Yeah, I do. I don't know if you knew this, but uh, you know the Buffalo Soldiers that suffer, right? The Buffalo Soldiers. Mm -hmm. They used to be a unit of the Buffalo Soldiers at, at, at Fort Lewis, back back Camp Lewis back in the day. Mm -hmm. So in DuPont, there's like a, a historical marker talk about them and stuff. Oh, wow. Cool, yeah. I'll, oh, wow. I'll, I'll take a picture of it and send it to you. Oh, man, that'd be awesome, yeah. man. It's Like there's a history of that, like that people don't realize. Like it's because up here it is very passive. Yeah, very passive. Like, like I said, where I was living at, like I went to uh, Camp Shelby is in Mississippi. But now it's I think it's pretty much is when when uh when I got ready to go to Iraq that was in 2004 training and everything it was called Mobe Center Shell because that's where everybody in Mississippi was mobilizing from people were coming from other states so it became because Camp Shelby is like the largest training facility in like the United States so it literally you could just train out there barracks everywhere like you just be out in the wood for days because it's so large and vast, but that's what everybody was mobilizing from, like tanks everywhere. So it's like, I was so used to seeing convoys on the highways, like you in high school, and then you'd see a convoy going by because there's a military base over here, but it's like up here, I don't remember the last time I seen a, a military vehicle on the road. No, not pure. Cause I know at Fort Lewis, we were like, kind of some, we would convoy from Fort Lewis to Yakima. We, we go to, I think exit 167. Like we never come past up to Seattle at all, you know? Yeah, I've been out towards Yakima and seen military convoys. Yeah. It's like yeah, yeah that's what you don't never come up here. I mean, you might see some Black Hawks here once in a while. Of course, the the Blue Angel when they do like the yeah. stuff like that, but that's more for so. Yeah, yeah, definitely, De definitely some Top Gun Blue Angel action going. Yeah, on. but yeah, you're right. You don't necessarily. Uh, yeah, it's like you don't see it. If I see him, it's probably a a hit or maybe a couple of Hummers. Mm -hmm. But yeah, usually, usually ain't nothing like that. You know. No. No. Um, like, so I think this in your bio it says the creativity, positivity, and, and individuality. Welcome to the journey of the original spur. Where did that come from? Um, things that I believe in. Um, and I was trying to think of a good tagline as far as what your values are when it comes to art. Um, 
creativity, positivity, and individuality is, is big because as an artist, you do a lot of things alone, but it's not just being uh, individuality. Take the microphone a little bit closer. Oh, it's not just like an individuality as far as um, being alone, but also but an individuality as being able to have your work in your style, whatever style that is, and being able to stand uh, on that as well, as opposed to having people like, have you ever tried to, hey, you seen such and such, man, you should try doing something like that. And it's like, no, because that's them. It's not me. And the positivity, of course, is, you know, approaching things in in good faith, coming in into spaces in good faith. You know, not coming in and being like, man, I seen such and such down the street. They stuff way. It's just like, no, like you coming in here to to enjoy it just like everybody else. Yeah, I'm an artist, but I like to go in and see other artists and and marvel in it as well. Because then I start getting ideas, like I said, and getting inspired by that because all it makes me want to do is go create like, man, they were on it. I need to go and step it up. I need to go do something where I had an idea, but now that I see it, it can actually be possible. Now I got a way I can figure out my own. And then just, you know, being creative in, you know, in your work and whatever you do, not just settling for, you know, the easy way out all the time. Sometimes, you know, it's almost like having on a busy shirt and a busy jacket. It's like sometimes you need to balance it out. Like, hey, if my background is busy, then this main thing can just be real smooth and simple. It doesn't all have to be the busiest thing ever, but also just about pushing your creativity and just trying to, you know, come up with these different concepts that just make your, your yourself say, wow. You know, if it makes you say, wow, it's like, man, I can't wait for other people to see this because it's not about getting the validation. It's about sharing that joy you feel like, man, I can't just keep this at home. Like I got to show this to somebody. So then that's what, uh, cause a lot of artists, they do keep stuff to themselves because they don't want either to, they don't want their first thought that I hope don't nobody critique it mm-hmm. or I hope nobody, you know, they don't like it. It's like, no, share that, share that, you know, that gift with others, you know, put it, put yourself out there and trust me, it'll be okay because if you love how it looks, other people are going to love how it looks because whatever you create, there should be a story behind it because there's always a motivation of why you've done it. You know, I don't like creating something to where it's just like, you know, I just thought it'd be cool. It's like I did it because I was thinking about this, man. I was like, man, this would be a dope concept to combine these because this thing is like this, and this is how I got it to come out like this. You know, have a reason behind it because stories is what draws people in and makes them care about your artwork. You know, they care, they care way more when you can give them a reason why, not only why you should buy it, but it's like, this is why I did it. This was my why, and that's why it's important. Let's suppose you're working on a piece of art and you're like, like you said, you're in the zone, right? You're focused mm-hmm. and everything's clicking. Yeah. And then before you know it, you work for eight hours. Like, mm-hmm. how do you make sure, like, you know, okay, maybe I need to take a break. Maybe, 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 maybe I need to go drink some water, have mm-hmm. some food, maybe I need to go to sleep. How do you make sure you do that? Or do you like, or do you prefer like working all the way through until it's finished if you're in that zone? Honestly, I have, I, I usually will, um, if I start finding, if I start feeling stiff, like, cause usually, honestly, when I paint, if I'm sitting down, I'm usually sitting on a yoga ball. It's like, cause I need to be able to move my hips and I can bounce around and I can red back and roll around on it. It's like, but then there's certain aspects where it's like, I need to stand up and I'll just stand and paint. But then I found that when I'm painting and I know I'm really locked in, it almost feels like I'm working because it's like, I'll start to feel warm. Like, Man, have you showered? <laughs> like, <laughs> hold on, man. And it's like sometimes it'd be that way because, like, on um, I was painting when I finished her the main body of this latest painting. It was one of those gray days. So the gray in the morning looks like the gray in the afternoon looks like the gray in the evening until the light starts going away. But then you, I find like, yeah, I have to literally pull myself away because every once in a while, boom, I look at the phone and be like. 2.30 already. I can't believe I'm paying for since 10 o'clock this morning. I've already put that many hours in. And usually what I will say is I need to use up the rest of this paint before I leave out. So I'll usually have enough. I need to finish this palette and then I'll take a break and leave because 
sure I could leave and spray it down and just to keep it moist, but it's like, I'm so locked in. I don't want to stop this flow that if anything, I'm just going to use up the rest of this paint and then I'll take off. But sometimes it's hard. I've literally painted until it turned night, nighttime, like from sun up to sundown, 12 hours and didn't even realize it before you know it. It's like, God darn, it's 830. I ain't left the house not once today. So it's like you just sometimes you just have to kind of force yourself and pull yourself away from it. It's like, I right, I'm going to use the rest of this and then I'm going to take a break and, and, you know, leave the house or, you know, go get a shower at least, you know, get something to eat in my system. Because when I'm locked in, I might have only eaten once that day. And that was probably that morning. Now it's seven o'clock at night. I haven't eaten anything that day. Just drink some water or some energy drink and I'm good. But you just you just be going and you don't want that groove to stop. You don't want anything to disrupt that groove. So you have to find a good stopping point. And it's usually after I've completed something like I need to finish this shoulder and that's then it'll be done. I want to be like to a point where, because I've already mixed all the paints that I need and I can just freestyle. I can flow and use up the rest of these and then I'll stop. So do you have any mentors where it's like per, your personal life, business or art that you talk about? Um, man, I can honestly, it's like, I don't think I've ever really had mentors that I can think of. I don't know. Cause I never looked at them like that. I never looked at people as, as a mentor type of thing. I always looked at it as maybe I have people that, um, that I can just talk to about, you know, whatever the situation is, if, you know, whether, if it's an idea for something like, like fancy, fancy Vargas, me and her talk a lot and she's extremely smart and, and, and I will get, I will pick her brain because sometimes I need somebody who's not a direct artist. Like she's a creative in the sense of she's a, a curator. She can curate any daggum thing, I swear. So I get perspectives from her from the outside because I'll be asking her things art-based things, but I'm like, when you look at this, what is it that you see? What do you think I should do? When you see, this is what I'm trying to do. This is my plan. But what do you think about this? You know, oh, I'm trying to do this. I want to, maybe I want to do some clothing or do some shirts or something. What do you think I should do? Which design do you think I should go with? Which one do you think would be more appealing? So it's like, I value people like that, um, you know, opinion and things. Um, my man, Jeff, Jeffrey Cheat, um, actor, playwright, children's book author. And I've been wanting to write a children's book. But then it's like, man, I hadn't written in so long. You start getting stuck and you reach out to somebody that knows how to do these things. And you're just like, man, I need some help. man. I need some advice. This is my idea. What do you think? And then he start asking probing questions. You're like, I ain't even think about that because for him, it's like drinking water. But like for me, it's like, how do I pick up the cup? You know, so it's like I have these people's it's like, I guess I never look at it like, oh, that's a, a mentor. I, I just look at them as, you know, these are people that I can rely on if I know I need something. I know they're willing to to advise me and, and you know, and help me out with those type of things. Um, but those are also people that I really value because. I value that they're going to be honest. Like, I don't like yes people. Don't tell me something that's dope just because you want to please me and make me happy. It's like, no, tell me what you really think, man. Well, I think you should. And then it's like, okay, because I can respect that because I already respect you. So I'm going to respect what you have to say. Short of you, just like, man, this is trash. You need to throw it. It's like, no, man, tell me what you honestly think, you know? Um, and I really do value, value people like that because they think so deep about, about things. Um, when I seen that name, I was like, oh, Kelvin. I was like, Kelvin uh, Pepper. He's another dope individual, like very thought provoking. Someone you can just sit down and talk to, um, pick his brain about things as well. Like we would just have conversations here and there. And it's just like, hey, man, I got this scenario because, you know, he's a, you know, psychologist. So it's like if you have things that you're thinking about, even uh, in that space of, of relationships or just how to deal with people, how you should move around certain situations. 
I just need a little bit of advice about I'm thinking this way, you know, actually getting some honest feedback from somebody and not just telling you some stuff that you might want to hear. You know? So how how you just talked about Calvin Fancy and, and Jeffrey Cheatham. Mm -hmm. Are you doing that for someone else? Uh, right now, I would say the uh, I do have like I would say my man uh, and my man JT, me and him talk almost every day. You know, we just talk about life. We talk about relationships. We talk about our own struggles that we've had to deal with because um, I'm older than him. And and he'll tell me he's just like, man, I just really appreciate you actually speaking with me and just just having another man to, to speak to, because I may not have these type of people in my life that I can really rely on to give me an honest opinion about some or honest view on something. Um and and those type of things matter because you need that kind of camaraderie with with other people as well. You need those type of camaraderie with other men as well to be able to be vulnerable with and and lay something out there, whether it's hypothetical, whether it's you know a serious situation. You need to have somebody you can bounce those things off with. Um, I'm also teaching artists with urban artworks, so I'm working with youth, with you know preteen. Well, not preteens, but mid teens so usually anywhere between 13 to, to 19. So you may have the oldest one in your classroom is like only 17, but we're working with them on an art, uh, artistic basis, but it's also more about helping them come out of their shell as well and, get, and getting used to certain things like speaking to other people, being direct with other people, looking at people in the eyes, being told no, because what we're working on is ultimately painting a mural for a client so expectation and just getting you prepared for rejection also because what if your idea doesn't get chosen but your peers do like how are you going to deal with that like how do you deal with that disappointment how you deal with rejection because these are things that are going to happen to you it's not far-fetched but you also have to understand it's not personal against you as well so there are different things like that that we go through in those those classes not just oh, this is different art techniques. Like, no, these are things you can use outside of art as well because it's going to really be something that's going to happen to you at some point, you know, and not all of them take those type of things well. Not all of them can take rejection well. Some of them just really sit in their head and just be like, why? You know, so it's just something like that that you, you kind of have to walk them through and get them comfortable to be able to talk about as well because there's a lot of introverted teens and they just kind of hold it. And, yeah. You know, they don't really say much. Mm -hmm. and so you have to give them slowly, get them comfortable with being okay. Like this is a safe space for us. This is all about what you guys want to do, how you communicate and how you work together with one another. And we're here to kind of guide you to do that. So let's fast forward 20 years from now, right? Uh -huh. You're 2025 in 20 years. What do you want your career to be at? Like you want to have like a certain number of pieces are sold. You want to have like, you want to have like your own art gallery? Do you want to have like some kind of art you want to do? Like what in 20 years, what's going to determine that in your mind, mm -hmm. you've had a good career as an artist? Honestly, yeah, that uh, I would love to have my own gallery and event space to where I can showcase art. Other people can showcase art almost like down here where like Axis is like in a, a space where you can have multiple things going on, on at once. People can can utilize that space. People can utilize it for a studio space for them themselves as well. Um, because you value stuff like that as an artist, man. The majority of artists, we do our work in our living room. Your bedroom might be your studio. If you got a garage, that might be your studio space. Um, it, it's just like, that's going to, you, you do it wherever you can, you know? Um, so yeah, I would, Love that it ain't even about like, oh man, I you know how many pieces like look, man, I'll sell pieces some days and some days I don't. But it's like it's not gonna stop me from working. But ultimately it's like, yeah, love to have like a gallery space, studio space that can also be used for other artists to to utilize those spaces as well to, you know, get themselves out there and not make them feel like you gotta pay this exorbitant amount of money to just get it in there for one night. You'd be like, come on. You're like, yeah, we're going to take uh, this 50-50 split on anything you sell. You'd be like, what? I'm okay with that. It's like, yeah, that's that's kind of outrageous a lot of times because then it also forces artists to 
hike up their prices because I got to at least try to get my money back that I was originally going to sell it for because you want to take so much from it. Um, so I wanted to, you know, to have something like that. Um, you know, that would be, that would be fantastic. Uh, you have any upcoming art shows? You're going to be showing your, your stuff out that people can, know about? Um, they can go check it out. That's coming up soon. Yeah. Give me a second. Okay. Here, Cause uh, there is, I'm just waiting to hear back from, uh, waiting to hear back from, from some people, but I know one thing that I'm, I know the thing that I'm applying for is for, Sh- for Sean Pike, like the, uh, the storefront. Mm-hmm. Cause I hadn't done that yet. I know some artists that have done that. And I'm like, yeah, I need to get inside that storefront. Definitely. Um, I am, like I said, we have an event that's going to be at Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. That'll be in January. So okay. be on the lookout for, for that's, that stuff to be uh, posted online as well. Um, that'll also be curated by Fancy Vargas as well with Elevate PRM. Um, I am waiting for a uh, word back from Tacoma Community College right now because there is going to be um, an event for a uh, Black Artist Exhibition. I think this is their third year. I did it last year. And by doing that, like I said, that exhibition right there brought me some good attention, you know, from other organizations as well. Like I was able to sell one of my original pieces to a college because they reached out to them who saw my work and they wanted that for their gallery and their, their school. Um, that brought me some commissions from nonprofit organizations within the city of Seattle as well. So just already high for that. So I'm just waiting to hear back from them so I can know when to okay. bring my work to them. Um, but that's like, um, I think a third annual like black artist exhibition in Tacoma community college as well, uh, that I'm prepping for. Um, and you know, like for me, I got to a point now where I used to jump on everything. Now I'm a much more selective about what I attend to or what I apply for as well. Um, it's just one of those things where I found it's like that saying, like all money ain't good money. Yeah. It's just one of those things where it's like, sometimes the juice ain't worth the squeeze, you know, once you actually get in there. So it's like, I just, I pick and choose what I'm, I'm going to be a part of being much more selective because when you start doing like, you know, a lot of paintings and they become larger and larger, you don't want to be traveling around with a lot of your (laughs) original, you don't want your uh, travel around with your original stuff for one day. Yeah. Like, so you, sometimes you just have to be selective. Like, okay, I'm going to bring these type of things Mm -hmm. uh, out specifically. Um, and I'm more than likely going to, you know, it just continue to do it that way because it allows me to focus on the things mm-hmm. that I want to do. That's going to be more important. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, I, I just try to continue doing things like that. Um, there will be an upcoming, uh, black makers and creatives that going to be at the, I believe the Renton Hyatt as well. That'll be coming up in the next couple of months. Like I said, those will be things that will start to get pumped on social media soon. Uh, as well. And like I said, you know, we have the Cultivate Collective Art Boutique that's at the Bellevue Arts Museum. We have the literally taken over the the gift shop space in there. We have about 30 plus artists and artisans in there. So you can come in there, get your art, come in there and and get candles, jewelry, um, clothing. So we all have that all there at the Bellevue Arts Museum shop as well. So uh, we try to make sure that we uh, stay active, man. <laughs> nice. So, Charles, anything else that I asked you that I didn't know? Anything else you want to talk about? Uh, man, I just I'm free flowing. <laughs> I don't have I don't have a, a checklist in my head, okay. man. I'm I'm I just be open. <laughs> cool, cool. Um, can you share your social media with us so people can uh, reach out to you? Yeah, yeah, sure. So you can find me at uh, you can find me on my website, uh, theoriginalspur.com. So. All like it sounds, the original spur. That's S P U R dot com. Same thing for my IG, uh, the original spur, and my Facebook as well, the original spur. So as all of those things get linked together, okay, um, as well. So pretty easy to find, very approachable. If you have questions or anything like that, man, I, I answer anybody that 
unless you're a bot talking about, <laughs> hey, you want to improve your Instagram? You're like, man, if you don't get on out of here. <laughs> yeah, so many of those. Yeah, so many of those. definitely. Can't stand that. I'm like, delete. Yeah. Delete. Get out of here. No, thank you. Cool. Hey, Charles, thanks for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, man. I appreciate this, Jason, and I'm just grateful. Thanks. thanks. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.